Hello everyone, my name is Rishabh Gandhi. I am the Senior Director at EB5AN, overseeing India and GCC. In today's video, we are going to discuss some common sources of funds and the key points to remember when remitting money from India. Before we begin, I want to clarify that this presentation is not intended as a legal or a financial advice, but rather as a reflection of my experience working with Indian families in their EB-5 journey. I highly recommend each one of you engage your own legal and financial advisors. We will cover the following topics today. We'll start with the company introduction and then we'll dive into some of the common sources of fund that I've seen in India, uh, followed by the remittance considerations. Uh, we'll also discuss some of the EB-5 rural and urban projects that we have right now. Established in 2013, EB-5 AN owns and operates 10 plus regional centers covering 48 of the 50 US states. Uh, and, you know, we've built a very strong record of several successful projects. This slide shows a map of where our investors come from. Investors from over 60 countries have found value in partnering with us on their EB-5 journey. Our 10 plus regional centers gives us the flexibility to explore projects that align with our investment philosophy and allows us to be geographically agnostic. EB-5AN was founded by Samuel Silverman and Michael Schoenfield, who have collectively managed over $4 billion worth of leverage buyouts, IPOs, and real estate development. A bit about me, my experience spans across India, the UK, Europe, and the Middle East, focusing on real estate and investment migration. I graduated from Nottingham Business School in the UK in 2014 and have been involved in real estate ever since. Let's understand what is source of fund and how does it fit with EB-5. So if you look at the USCIS requirements, when you're making the $800,000 investment for your EB-5, the USCIS wants to know that this is your own capital. They want to establish that you, know, you are the legal owner and that these funds are lawfully obtained by you. And the third part and the most important part is, you know, you need to establish a trail of how you accumulated this $800,000 over the, over the last couple of years uh, to be able to save this kind of money for an EB-5. If you look at your I-5 to 60 petition, which is at the forefront of your EB-5 filing, uh, you will see it is divided into two parts. The first part is the project documentation, explaining how the investment satisfies the EB-5 criteria. When you're working with a regional center, uh, this compliance is usually taken care by them. Post the Reform and Integrity Act, uh, USCIS requires all regional centers to file an I-956F filing for the projects. Uh, in our case, you know, the I-956F of some of our projects has already been approved. So you know that that part is taken care of. So the moving or the dynamic part is your source of fund. And hence, hence it's very, very important that you engage an immigration attorney before you start running diligence on any projects. The immigration attorney will help you document your lawful source of funds and also ascertain, you know, whether a particular source that you're planning to use or liquidate for your EB-5 would be viable or not. Let's look at some of the common source of funds that have come across uh, over the years working with Indian families here in India. Uh, the first and the most common one is the ordinary income. This is income that you or your spouse have earned over the years. It can be through an employment or you know, running your own business or a mix of that. Uh, this eventually forms the basis of your investment because you, know, you may have earned some money initially where you have reinvested this money into multiple asset classes, uh, which has over time grown. Uh, or, you know, you may have saved some portion of this money, uh, you know, kept it aside in a fixed deposit uh, or a recurring deposit. And I've managed to save $800,000 over the last couple of years and want to now use this as an EB-5. Uh, the more popular option that I see here in India is the capital gains. Uh, I think Indians, uh, we love real estate. And uh, predominantly, I would say around 70% of my cases, I've seen families liquidating one of their assets. You know, this can be a house or a piece of land, uh, you know, that they have bought several years ago. And now, you know, they've generated some kind of return on that. They've liquidated that and they want to use the proceeds of that uh, as their EB-5. Uh, very, very popular option. Uh, the other part of capital gains is, you know, the stock markets, mutual funds, you know, where you have systematically invested, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, managed to make some money out of it. And, you know, now you want to use that extra money for your EB-5.
the third and the popular option uh, that I see is gifts or inheritance. Uh, gifts are more common here in India. So I see a lot of parents doing EB-5 for their kids. You know, they are already in the U.S. on an F-1 visa or, you know, somewhere, you know, when they are 14 or 15 years old, uh, you know, they have an idea that, you know, the, their kids will be uh, going to the U.S. So they, you know, plan to do uh, an early EB-5 filing for them since this is a medium or a long-term planning. Uh, the fourth option is loans from family or friends or, or you know, third party with or without collateral. This became popular after the Zhang versus USCIS case. Uh, again, very commonly used in India, uh, you know, borrowings from family or borrowing from a third party with or without collateral is an acceptable source of fund and also very popular in India. Let's look at some of the frequently encountered speed bumps for Indian investors, right? So uh, let's start with the residential status. Uh, you know, for today, we'll only focus on resident Indians. So this is basically families uh, who are resident Indian and living in India. And, you know, what are the speed bumps that they encounter when they're trying to remit this money out for EB-5? The, the first point is, you know, the TCS. Uh, as you all know, you know, there is some ambiguity around TCS. I want to clarify that any money uh, now that is being sent out will attract a 20% TCS. Let's look at the liberalized remittance scheme. Uh, so as per the Indian income tax, uh, every individual who has a PAN card is allowed to send up to 250,000 US dollars per financial year. The other speed bumps that I encounter in India uh, is a document mismatch, right? So your name or your date of birth on two identities would not match. You know, sometimes we have clients where the birth certificate is missing, the marriage certificate is missing. Uh, we have an on-ground presence here. We work with consultants who can help you retrieve those documents. Uh, reach out to us, you know, if you need help with any of this. The last part is the taxation part. So please uh, don't look at EB-5 as a way of, you know, escaping tax. USCIS requires that any income that you've derived, if there is a tax obligation, it has to be met. You know, whether it is in your home country, you may have derived this income anywhere else in the world. If there is a tax obligation, you will have to meet that. Only that is an acceptable source of fund. Uh, let's look at the steps involved, uh, you know, when you're sending money abroad. Uh, again, you know, this is applicable only for a resident Indian because the LRS schemes are only applicable to them. Uh, uh, like I highlighted earlier, you know, under the LRS, you're allowed 250,000 US dollars uh, per fiscal year per PAN card. Uh, India follows the March-April window. Uh, so moving on, uh, you know, we have to establish, you know, when you're sending money out, whether this is a current account transaction or a capital account transaction. So LRS allows you to send money out under these two heads. Uh, so a business travel gifts and maintenance of relative would come under current account transactions, investments in foreign company asset, or you know, opening a subsidiary or capital account transactions. Uh, the third step is you know you you work with your ad which is the authorized dealer uh, mostly you know in our case these would be banks uh, you fill out a form called as the a2 form uh, you know when you're filling out the a2 form you know the banks would want to understand the reason you want to remit this money out and they would ask for the recipient details uh, so they would want to know the entire name uh, you know of the project that you are wiring this money into uh, the the name on the escrow account any other details that you can furnish uh, would help you make this process smoother. Uh, again, you know, the banks also want to understand, you know, where this money is coming from and whether all the taxes on the same has been paid. Uh, this is usually a self-declaration that you have to sign at the banks and, and they are okay with that. Uh, the fifth and the most important part is, you know, where we see a lot of our clients uh, miss out uh, is the 15 CACB. So if you look at the FEMA uh, and the income tax, you know, if you're sending money out, uh, your chartered accountant has to e-file something called as a 15 CA or a CB form. Uh, you know, please reach out to us if you want more details on this and we'll be happy to work with your chartered accountant to ensure that any money that you're remitting, uh, you know, would not violate any FEMA or income tax uh, rules. Uh, let's dive into the frequently asked questions, uh, you know, from Indian clients. Uh, the first one and the popular one is, you know, will I be taxed on my investments abroad and how can I save TCS? Uh, so the answer is no. So you will not be taxed on the capital that you're sending abroad. However, any income that you are generating out of that capital that you're sending out uh, will be taxable, right? Uh, 
looking at TCS, so I want to clarify that TCS is not an expense. Like, look at TCS, you know, anything that you pay towards TCS, uh, obviously, you know, initially it's an extra outgo for you, but this is a credit that you receive against, you know, any income tax that is liable during the year. Uh, so, for example, if you don't have any income tax liability in that fiscal year, you can file your return and the entire 20% can come back as a refund. The second popular question that I usually get asked is, uh, Risha, will I be allowed to repatriate this money back uh, in India uh, on maturity? Uh, the answer is yes. You know, the income tax and the FEMA allows you to repatriate any money uh, and, you know, any income that you've made on that money uh, freely back to India. Uh, the third question, you know, that I get asked is, you know, how do I file my income tax returns? How do I show this? Uh, you know, do I have to show the interest income that I've earned abroad? Uh, the answer is yes. So as a resident Indian, we are liable for a global taxation. So any income that you know you are generating on your investment is taxable in India. Uh, if the recipient country uh, you know who's receiving your investment has already deducted some taxes on that, you can work with your chartered accountant to check something called as a DTAA, which is the double tax avoidance agreement, and you know confirm whether any additional tax liabilities would arise on on this income in India. The fourth and, you know, the most popularly ignored point uh, is under the FEMA rules, any capital that you send out, if it is not used or not spent uh, within 180 days has to be repatriated back. Uh, you know, recently we've seen uh, a lot of our clients, you know, sending more than uh, what is required out and you know if like i said if it's unused or unspent you have to bring it back so you know please speak to us uh, and you know we can help you figure out how much money do you need to send out for your eb5 the fifth one is the lrs limit so clients usually want to understand uh, how the lrs works right so for example you have a 250 thousand dollar limit now bear in mind you know when you're spending towards shopping you know traveling abroad uh, anything that you do on your credit card uh outside india you know you're exhausting your limit and it is not restricted to the us so for example if you take a trip to dubai or singapore uh, and you're using your indian credit card and say you spend around ten thousand dollars on tickets and shoppings and hotels so now you're left with two hundred and forty thousand dollar limit so please you know when you're sending money out ensure that you understand how much balance is available and that you do not violate any fema or rbi guidelines uh, this limit is renewed uh, every fiscal year. So, for example, if you have a limit of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar in in March, and you plan to send say two hundred thousand uh, dollars by April, you will have a fresh limit of another two hundred and fifty thousand dollar. But bear in mind, any unused limit does not carry forward, right? So, if you say, uh, Rishab, you know, twenty twenty three, I have not sent anything out. You know, have the entire two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then in the year twenty twenty four, can I send five hundred? The answer is. No. Let's look at our EB5N urban and rural projects that we have uh, at 800K. Uh, I'll start with the extreme right. Uh, uh, you know, we have Wohali Yuta. Uh, it is now completely sold out, uh, but we're very proud of this project. And, you know, that's why we wanted to highlight this uh, to our investors. So this is, you know, 5,000 acres of land, 428 houses. The phase one is, you know, nearly sold out. We've created over 700 jobs. Uh, the project has already received the I-956F approval and multiple I-5 to 6 e approvals. Uh, moving on, we have the Kindred Resort at Keystone. Uh, this is also a debt project. Uh, you know, the, we are expecting the construction to be completed by next year. Uh, around 1,260 jobs have already been created. Uh, we're raising 80 million, so that's approximately 100 investors. So for all the 100 investors, the job creation is already done. Apart from that, you know, EB-5 will become the first priority mortgage on the property after construction. Moving on, uh, you know, we'll speak a little bit more about Twin Lakes, which has been a very popular project for us. Uh, the reason for its popularity is because it comes with a repayment guarantee from Coulter, uh, Coulter's parent company. So Coulter is the developer here. Uh, Coulter has never failed to complete a project or repay a loan since 1997. Uh, we've worked with Coulter over several su successful EB-5 projects. Uh, the project is already around 620 homes, uh, you know, which has been sold. Uh, 3,100 jobs have already been created. Uh, this is our fund three in this particular project. The prior funds have already received the I-956F approval, and they've also received multiple I-526E approvals.
moving on to the urban categories uh, you know the trade off is you wait a little longer for your green card if you are uh, you know if you are born in india china vietnam uh, but you know you you get a higher return and a shorter tenure so we understand that one size does not fit all and hence you know we have a diverse range of offerings uh, briefly you know the equity project is again by colter uh, since you are coming at the start of the project colter is offering a higher return which is 5% on your investment and you are looking at a shorter tenure of 3.75 years uh, this is very reasonable since you know uh, the sustainment period announcement by uscis uh, you know this basically fits for anybody who is looking for a shorter tenure but is okay to wait a little longer for their green cards moving on you know this is again a part 2 of the same project where we are doing a debt uh, again this will come with a repayment guarantee from colter uh, and we are we're looking at a 3 plus 1 year timeline so if you are interested in learning more about our projects uh, reach out to us you know and we'll be happy to guide you i hope this video has given you a clear understanding of you know the source of fund and the remittance considerations for your eb5 journey uh, please like share and subscribe for more valuable content and thank you for watching and see you in the next video